For those that have joined, we are going to be doing our Real Chemistry ASCO 2021 review. You're going to get the physician viewpoint, a little bit of the patient experience, a little bit of the scientific experience, a little bit of the what happened on digital, social, and earned media, but we promise it will be awesome. So with that, I think we could go ahead and get started since it's uh, right at the top of the hour. Thank you for taking away the slide because then we can't see all these amazing faces. So again, um, many of you know me, and if you don't, I'm Aaron Strout. I am the CMO of Real Chemistry, and I am playing the master of ceremonies. I'm going to say as little as possible today because you have, like I said, a lot of really great, smart people on. I'm going to do some quick introductions, and then I will kick us off. So starting in my top left, you have the fabulous Jennifer Paganelli, aka JPags, who is our practice lead for our Earn Media Group and one of our resident ASCO experts. Jen, I think you've gone, or JPags, I should say, you've probably gone, what, eight, 10, 12 times. So yeah, um, up a little bit. You think I, I'm younger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, a seasoned veteran, even though she looks much younger than that. Um, over to my right, I have uh, Ujwal Piatti, uh, or Uj, as we all like to call him. He's a practice lead for our scientific strategy group. Uh, and then rolling below him, we have Matt Titus. Matt Titus is our EVP of our uh, health technology platform sales group. And then last but not least, we have a fabulous uh, speaker from outside and who will represent the, uh, the doctor, the physician viewpoint, and that's Dr. Alejandro Gutierrez, who is a pediatric oncologist and a researcher at Boston's Children, Boston Children's Hospital, fellow Red Sox fan, which I appreciate. I'm originally from Boston, so I know we didn't talk about that, and JPEGs is shooting me daggers here. But with that, the way we're going to format this today is... I'm going to go off screen and the first half of the discussion will be Uj and Dr. G, as we'll call him, because that rolls right off the tongue. Um, he and Dr. G are going to be talking and we're going to get a little bit more into that, you know, physician's viewpoint. What does COVID look like? How has it impacted cancer? Um, he, he does treat children with leukemia. You know, what does that meant for treating little kids? Um, you know, key themes from uh, ASCO or takeaways and how does that apply to the situation? So we're going to let them go for about 15, 17 minutes. And then, uh, and, and Matt and JPEGs may jump in and ask some questions. And then the second half will be JPEGs and Matt talking a little bit more about the earned media, the digital, the social, some of the trends that came out of it, some key points. Uh, and then we'll, I'll come back on and we'll wrap it at the end. So with that, uh, we'll let you all take it away. And Uj and Dr. G really looking forward to this conversation. Oh, one last thing is if you do have questions, I know those of you watching it on YouTube live, um, do pop questions into the, the chat down on the right bottom right hand corner. We'll try to get to some of them if we can. We do have a packed agenda, but we are keeping an eye on that. And I will thread that through to our uh, esteemed speakers. So, Uj? Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate it. Dr. G, Alejandro, as I know you, we did our postdocs together. And, you know, Alejandro has uh, really persisted in his career through, uh, you know, the tough days of science and in, in not knowing whether an experiment is going to kill your career one day to being a renowned um, oncologist, but also researcher. And what's really interesting, particularly about the tie to ASCO is the idea of bench to bedside. And we always talk about that at Real Chemistry. And, you know, um, starting from when a molecule is first discovered all the way through to when it's actually delivered to patients. Alejandro or Dr. G, I'm interested in your perspective on you know, what inspires you from the bench to how you treat patients and vice versa? When you're treating a patient, how does that inspire you to really be your best at the bench in the discovery phase of new molecules that can apply uh, broadly to patients with cancer? So it's a real privilege to be able to do both. Um, you know, I um, grew up wanting to be a doctor and wanted to treat cancer, um, but I became really dissatisfied with the status quo of clinical oncology as a fellow when I met, you know, two kids, just unbelievable kids, teenagers both, who um, had essentially what looked to us like the same disease. And one of whom had a great response to therapy, um, you know, had some side effects, but nothing unmanageable and did great. Um, and now, you know, comes to see me almost 15 years later with her kids. Um, and the other patient who had what we thought was the same disease had just a horrible, horrible course with uh, numerous, you know, really life-threatening complications of treatment. These are drugs that I prescribed that almost killed this child more than once. 
um, and then ultimately relapsed and died. And um, that left me really profoundly dissatisfied because, you know, I was like, we should have just sent this kid to Disney and save him all this trouble. So that's really motivated my work as a researcher, as a scientist. We're really um, focused on understanding treatment resistance and developing new therapies. And, um, you know, the clinical work is humbling in many ways because it just highlights there's a lot we don't understand. We've got a long way to go. But it's also, you know, so inspiring to see how these kids um, you know, the strength of character uh, that they show in the face of really horrible diseases uh, and treatment that sometimes makes things worse, it's just unbelievably expiring. It's a real privilege to take care of them. And it's especially exciting to be able to participate in clinical trials of new therapies, some of which we've had some role in, um, and, and really get to see how those work and, and hopefully really transform outcomes for, for many of these patients. Oh, that's great. And, you know, of course, one of the big themes at ASCO, the presidential theme was around equity. And you know, ensuring that every patient has access to medicines, and I think that part of that is really access to clinical trials as well as possibly the best route to curing their disease or at least giving them long-term remission. Can you comment on how you know what the challenges are today in recruiting patients to clinical trials, particularly those who maybe people of color, maybe in um, underserved populations? What are the challenges right now and how can we overcome those challenges you think as a, as a healthcare community? Right, so there are, you know, in many cases, some quite compelling clinical trials. And as you say, um, I, I think it's really uh, crucial that we are able to enroll patients and, and hopefully see some of these therapies succeed, understanding that of course, not everything will work. Um, but there are, uh, you know, there are some populations in this country uh, that really suffered profound and persistent injustices and discrimination. Mm -hmm. And this has led to what in many people is a fundamental distrust of the medical establishment. I think it's important as a doctor and as, a, as somebody invested in, in improving clinical trial enrollment to recognize that this is really not a crazy uh, conclusion. It's important to empathize with that position and engage as opposed to dismiss and, and uh, write that off. You know, some of the most prominent examples of these really horrific things that have happened to people is, you know, for example, the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in black men started in 1932 um, as a natural history study. So the idea was to follow patients, black men in this study with syphilis. Um, at the time, there was no treatment. And so you could argue that it wasn't so crazy. There were some problems, um, of course. So the patients didn't know they were on a study and they were never asked for permission. Um, but you know, for the first year, I think there was, would not have been quite the outrage that ensued. But you know, about 10 years into the study, penicillin was invented, profoundly active against syphilis. And it was not offered to these men for 30 years, 30 yes. years. Um, you know, they infected their partners, they gave birth to babies with congenital syphilis, some of whom had permanent neuro neurologic damage, some of who died. And the story was broken by an you know, AP reporter 30 years later, and of course led to outrage, as you might understand. But um, the idea that anybody could think this is okay is just kind of mind blowing. There have also been many examples outside of medicine, and the most recent one that comes to mind is this Tulsa race massacre that until this year I actually hadn't even heard of. Um, it makes you wonder how many other things we don't know about. Um, so all that to say, this is really not a crazy mindset. It's important to empathize, to engage, um, and to engage, you know, trusted community partners, uh, you know, maybe a pastor, maybe a family member with some healthcare background, um, and ultimately really to respect decisions. Some people will make decisions that you think you wouldn't make in that, um, in their position, but it's important to recognize that having different life experiences, you just don't know, you know, what you would do, having been, having had a di different background. Well, it's interesting you say that because one of the questions I have for you, you know, we talk about equity when it comes to patients, but it's also equity uh, for providers, right, such as yourself and, you know, people of color rising up through the ranks, through medical school, through, you know, their PhD programs to become the next generation of researchers and oncologists who are really driving the next great discoveries we hear about at ASCO. What have been some of the challenges you faced and how important is equity, um, you know, for oncologists in general? So I'll, maybe I'll take on the second half of that first. I, I think it's crucial to have um, equity and really diverse workforce for oncologists and really for every uh, part of the medical 
establishment. I mean, it, you might know it, it's sort of obvious walking around the hospital that minorities make a disproportionate uh, number of the healthcare workforce at, at sort of the lowest paying levels. So, you know, janitors and food service um, providers, and they're highly underrepresented in, you know, the nursing and the physician ranks. And to me, that's a crucial problem to um, improve both because it's the right thing to do. And also, I think it's really an opportunity for all of us to um, improve our organizations. I think, you know, I'm a sports fan, as many of you are, and I think a common theme among some of the most successful sport franchises is, is they recognize and value undervalued talent. And I, I think minorities in our in our country and in, in, in the society are generally undervalued. And so you can really find outstanding people um, if you're willing to go beyond the, you know, the sort of more, the things we normally use to, to assess people that are often biased. In terms of the challenges I've faced, you know, I've had really many advantages. I, I can't claim to have had um, a lot of problems. You know, I had an amazing supportive family that really values education and academic achievement. I was never hungry growing up. I always had a roof over my head, really a stable home. I had clean clothes to wear and I didn't have to work during college. Um, you know, I did however face some challenges and I think nowadays we would call most of these microaggressions questions like, you know, well, where are you really from uh, that sort of imply that you don't really belong. And there has been an occasional comment, especially in my med school evaluations that I, I thought was biased, but certainly it was better than it could have been. And certainly wasn't anything that I wasn't able to overcome. I do wonder though, you know, would I be here if I was darker skinned, if I had a strong accent, if I was a woman, or if I had to work a full time job rather than do research while I was in college, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't have had the same opportunities. Wow, that's really insightful. Thank you for that. Um, I know we're getting close to our time, the end of our time together. Uh, we could talk for an entire half hour, I'm sure. But, you know, one of the things we really focus on here at Real Chemistry and is really our North Star is the idea of, of patient experience and optimizing patient experience and patient outcomes. And in knowing about all these great new discoveries that have been presented at ASCO, whether it's, you know, new SHIP2 inhibitors, anti-like 3 therapies, uh, you know, an a new approach to treating metastatic uh, castration-resistant prostate cancer, these are all great and excellent discoveries, right? But in addition to the gaps in terms of recruiting patients to clinical trials who are people of color who are you know, maybe underprivileged or uh, underserved overall. There's also the delivery of medicines to patients and ensuring that they're first knowledgeable about the medicines they might be getting, but also that they actually have access to those medicines. What, what are your views on how we get better as a healthcare system in ensuring that that happens? Right, so there's, um, you know, there are a lot of challenges there and um, I think none of them are easy, but all are crucial to tackle. Um, as you mentioned, there are really some very exciting new approaches. And, you know, even if you look back over the last five years, there have been really some transformative advances in, in my world of pediatric leukemia. Many of these are immunotherapy based approaches that have really revolutionized how we can treat kids with either relapse leukemia or who have life threatening infections. You, you know, I'm sure you know that infection is a common side effect of chemotherapy. <laughs> and there are infections that would have been fatal in another age, um, if, if treatment had to be sort of this conventional immunosuppressive chemotherapy. And now actually we, you know, I can think back in the last couple of months, at least two patients where they've got a real chance of being cured without suppressing their immune system. So that's really very exciting. As you say, it's crucial to get this to all patients. You know, I'm not an expert in healthcare economics. I, I do think that having access to these therapies is crucial. I do also understand that there are real um, um, issues with paying for expensive medications, um, especially for people who don't have health insurance. And you know, I certainly am no expert in, in sort of how to solve that problem, although I'm all ears when it comes to people who know this much better than I. Um, right. It is, however, really important to recognize that there are really structural barriers to, um, uh, and really structural racism that, that prevents some many people from disadvantaged backgrounds from advancing. I think if you live in a, you know, in a part of a city that has, um, 
you know, no public transportation um, and poor air quality and, you know, no food other than greasy fast food and liquor stores. Um, it's awful hard to have a healthy diet and to, to keep yourself healthy and to come to your appointments and to do your medical screening. And so I, I think, you know, we all can apply, you know, at least political pressure and think about creative solutions uh, to address really all these barriers. Yeah, the last question I'll ask related to that is also about ensuring that um, patients have the right information about the products that they might be receiving and about their disease states overall and approaches to, to treating those diseases. You know, how do you, what are the tricks and tools that you use to communicate with broad populations of patients or in, in your case, parents who might be asking about new medications, about new approaches to treatment, et cetera? Yeah, and that has really to be very individualized. I, I think everybody's a unique person and in a different place. And there's some people who come in knowing exactly what they want. Sometimes they'll travel across the country or across the world to get on a particular clinical trial. And there are other people who are just resistant to any experimental medication. And so it requires engaging and, and respect. And, you know, I could think back to a recent case where, you know, this is a, a, a the father was a black man who, whose daughter was, you know, incredibly sick, very acutely with, you know, not knowing what was going on. It turns out she has cancer. She's in the ICU. She's near death. And, you know, I, I think many people get angry in that situation, sort of at the world. Um, and the first response that essentially happened in the hospital is security was called on him, which is like, he was not being violent. He, it was just like the worst thing to possibly do. And that immediately puts in his mind, and honestly, in my mind, the idea that this wouldn't have happened if he wasn't black. And immediately it takes you, you know, five steps back. And so building um, rapport, trust, and, you know, whenever possible, having a long-term relationship uh, built on trust and respect is really crucial here. Excellent. Thank you. I think that goatee is my sign, not your goatee, Dr. G, but the goatee of Aaron Strout is the sign that, uh, our time is finishing up here. So I'll hand it back to Aaron, but thank you so much. This was really great informative. I hope that the, uh, the folks who attended this got some, some great insights out of this conversation. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you both. We really appreciate it. And I, I, you know, we joked in our prep that you never book enough time to do this. And so uh, we could probably have gone for a good 45 minutes. You are welcome to stick around. And if you wanna chime in on the conversation, I think you both probably have some interesting insights, but. With that, we will turn it over to JPAGs and JPAGs. I've already seen this conversation happen early this morning. And so I think you're gonna be equally fascinated with this between JPAGs and Matt, but Ooh, certainly I know you pay close attention to ASCO and Dr. G since you know you live this and breathe it every single day, please feel free to chime in. Maybe just give a little sign that you'd like to break into the action because once they get going, they'll be fast and furious. But um, you know, stay tuned for the second part of the show. And again, thank you both for an engaging first part of the conversation. JPEGs. Thank you so much. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, Dr. G. It's great to and very inspiring to hear from such dedicated physicians and researchers like you who are really on the front lines dealing with patients, dealing with families day in and day out. So thank you for your, your service and sharing your insights with us. Um, I'm going to turn the turn the turn it a little bit to a different topic here. Um, I'm I have an earned media background, which means meetings like this, I'm usually on the phone with my team dealing with the reporters that are covering the advances in the science here at ASCO. But of course, for virtual and digital storytelling is more important now more than ever, particularly since we are not in McCormick Place and the conversation not only happens at the meeting and in and around the meeting, but throughout the year. So I couldn't be more thrilled to be joined by my colleague, Matt Titus. Matt is, um, as Aaron mentioned, part of our health tech group. And that means he and his team make our teams really smart about digital technologies and how different people, doctors, patients, advocates are using those to drive the conversation online and engage. So Matt, thank you for being here with me and for telling us a little bit about our simpler intelligence platform, um, which you and your team use to gather all of these insights that we're going to talk about today. Maybe kick that off and tell our listeners and our viewers a little bit about the surprising um, findings that you uncovered through your research. Sure, absolutely. So Simpler is our digital healthcare intelligence platform that we have here at Real Chemistry and, and offer to our clients in the subscription model as well. And what it allows us to do is really 
capture the insightful conversations that are happening digitally around things like events, congresses, uh, therapeutic categories that are happening live 24 seven in the world around us. It, it used to be an environment where I could just go have a conversation with you, JPEG, take away the information. That's all I needed to do to, to make my strategy or, or understand my engagement. But now there exists a, a second world digitally that happens uh, between keyboards, between folks that may have never met each other. And it, it really allows information sharing to take on a, a whole new level. Um, one of the things that we've been doing so far this year is monitoring ASCO. And I think we've come away with some, some surprising takeaways. Um, let's go first and, and talk about some of the terms that are trending digitally. Right now, patience is the number one term that's trending. And I think that really resonates here with us at Real Chemistry because our mission is really to put the patient at the, the center of everything that we do. And I think that that shows the clinical conversations that are happening. Dr. G, you mentioned it too. Your stories are not centered around you. They're not centered around your experience. They're centered around patients and the profound impact they have. So I think that's a, a key takeaway for us is that we really need to keep the patient at the center of, of what we're doing. It's interesting, Matt, because I would have guessed that one of the top trending um, terms would have been related to DE&I. Right, given that was equity was the theme of the meeting, we saw more and more presenters talk about the, the diversity of their trials, for example, when they were doing their data slides and, and presentations. Why is it surprising to you that that conversation is not translating online right now? I, I think it was definitely surprising to us. I think ASCO put forth a lot of effort to make sure that that was the uh, tentpole in this event, right? It's gonna be DE and I, we need to talk about health equity as Dr. G mentioned, right? How do we solve the, the challenges of making these life-saving medications available to everyone, regardless of the zip code that you were born in or how much money your parents make or your, your backgrounds, right? Um, and what we found is that the digital conversation, that is not a trending term right now. So I think to me, what that says is that we're just starting on this journey of health equity and DE&I. There's still a lot for us to do. Um, and we need to keep working on that to become a bigger part of the conversation if we really want to make that an issue that we're going to solve. It was interesting as I watched some of the presentations, the ones that really got me thinking were the ASCO Voices educational sessions. Um, that's where, for those of you not familiar, where doctors were not presenting data, they were simply doing one-on-one, -on -one, looking at the camera, talks, five-minute talks about a topic really important to them. And the majority of those topics were about, you know, how the face of medicine is changing. One was, was titled, Check Your Assumptions at the Door. And it was a variety of voices and it was really powerful. Um, can you tell me, Matt, based on what you're seeing in the simpler data, I mean, how, how important is the type of story we're telling online? You know, are the data stories pulling through with certain audiences? You and I were talking a little earlier about the, the importance of making storytelling human. Absolutely. I, I think one of the things that we're taking away from this, right, there were over 19,000 articles that have been shared since the conference started on uh, June the 3rd. There have been almost 65,000 visuals that have been produced by folks as well. But the number one piece of engaging content has been that ASCO featured voices piece. Um, it actually picked up over 350 engagements, just that piece alone. So I think what that tells us is that data releases are interesting. Uh, study results are interesting. But what really makes this interesting is the people, the story behind it. Why is it important to me? Why does it resonate with me? And, and I think that really underscores the fact that when we're developing engagement strategies, when we're developing our messaging, that we need to keep in mind an omni-channel approach that's really uh, taking into account not only the clinician, but the patient advocate, the patient themselves, to really understand that the way that those people consume information may be different, and my messaging has to be different to reach those folks as well. 
You raised so many interesting points I want to dig into, but I, I will try to control myself. Um, okay. First, you mentioned the importance of language. Our earned media team and our executive coaching team talk about this all the time, how we as an industry are using too much jargon. Of course, people are not connected to our mission of making the world a healthier place or really get it because the words we're using don't land with them. Talk to me a little bit about you know, language, simplicity, um, and bringing to life and, and meeting people where they're at in terms of health literacy to bring them along for the journey. I, I think you're, you're seeing that with the 65,000 uh, visuals that we mentioned, right? So I, I think it would be remiss for us to think that there are 65,000 data releases or studies that are being shown uh, digitally, right? What we're also seeing is that uh, physicians are communicating those out. Patient advocates are communicating those out. Advocacy organizations are communicating those out, but they're not using the study results themselves or the, the technical background. What they're using is infographics, right? That's the language that patients speak in. They want really important information, but in a way that's easily consumable to me in five to 10 seconds. I, I don't think it's realistic to think that a patient is going to read a a 40 page summary of a really robust research study. But is it important that we also inform the patient about what happened or conclusions that were drawn um, or really tell them what options they have? I think that's important. And I think the way that we communicate with them, as you mentioned, meet them where they are. Let's find how they consume information and let's put it into uh, chunks that are gonna make sense. And also that can be uh, consumed at the pace that people consume information in the consumer world. I love that because in years past, it used to be that clients or, you know, big pharma companies would issue a data release. You couldn't understand it. All these P values, what does it mean? But so they were being transparent in the sense of, okay, well, we put the information out there, but they weren't making that information accessible. And I think what we're seeing now is this demand by consumers, by patients, real people, their loved ones, in um, and, and holding companies accountable to delivering information in a way that they understand it. And I don't think that was the case um, years ago, and I'm glad to see that shift. Um, you mentioned another shift that I wanted you to kind of double click on this idea that the ASCO conversation used to be driven entirely by the agenda setting biopharma reporters, right? And maybe some Twitter savvy doctors who knew how to actually open an account and send a tweet. But now we're seeing patient advo advocates, patients themselves, advocacy organizations really kind of recalibrate the scales in terms of engagement. What did you see in your research around this year's meeting? Was that the case? That absolutely was the case. I think what we're seeing is that uh, we've talked about the democratization of data, right? When I have a keyboard and a smartphone at my fingertips, that conversation doesn't have to exist within the four walls of the room that I'm sitting. Now suddenly I can have an interaction or a conversation with a physician sitting in another country across the globe. It becomes more of a global conversation uh, and it allows other people access that didn't necessarily have access before. So as you mentioned, we're seeing a lot more uh, excuse me, participation from folks like researchers and academics, from folks like patient advocates and advocacy organizations who are digitally saying, hey, we have a seat at the table. We're important to this. Remember us. We're partners in this. And we also want to see better outcomes for the patient. How can we work together to make that happen? Interesting. I have one last question for you. Um, I know we're coming up on time. Um, I'd love to hear your perspective on some of the new platforms and, challenge, and um, channels rather that we're seeing engagement on. You know, we know Clubhouse, um, the rise of Clubhouse over the past six months. Some of us have debated, is that a fad? Is that here to stay? But we saw a lot of offline, conver online conversations happen there. Um, you mentioned TikTok to me earlier. Twitter Spaces, we know, was a hot channel for um, the dialogue to continue. What are you seeing there? And do you think those types of uh, channels are here to stay in terms of future meetings or year round? I, I definitely do. And, and here's why. I think that we're seeing physicians try to take this very clinical, very scientific information and communicate that out to patients. So you've never seen doctors on TikTok before, but now you do. They're making short little videos to help patients manage chronic conditions that are easy and consumable. Again, going to where 
patients consume information, meet them where they are. Uh, I think that we're going to continue to see that trend. Doctors uh, are becoming more innovative with how they deliver their messages, understanding that there is a digital conversation going on around in healthcare, and there's a really big space where they can impact that conversation by uh, focusing their messages across multiple platforms that patients also consume as well. I love that. I know as communicators, that's something we um, we try to counsel our clients on all the time, how to embrace other channels and platforms, not for the sake of doing it, um, but as part of a larger strategy of engagement with a two-way engagement with um, your audience, whether that's a patient, a doctor, or others. Um, I do see a question in the chat from my colleague, Christiana Pascal, who's on our earned media team. She asks, and maybe we can ask everyone, and I'll start with you, Matt, and then maybe we can go to Dr. G. Um, she asks, what's your, what's your perspective about the shift in how the cancer community has evolved how we talk about care in cancer? You know, we're ditching phrases like salvage therapy, or we should maybe, you know, how language like that or failing a treatment, you know, it's not the patient's fault they failed, right? What, do you, what are your thoughts about that? And then I would love Dr. G's perspective too about how he chooses his words when he's talking to patients and their families. I, I think it, uh, medicine is really evolving. It used to be very top down. A physician prescribes a medication, a patient takes it, and that's how they consume their information. I think there's really been uh, a rise in this idea of a patient navigator. So generally someone within a family unit or a group of friends takes the lead and tries to educate um, the patient or the groups of people supporting the patient, what access to resources are out there? What are my options in getting a second opinion? Um, what are the drugs that are available in this category or, or class? And so I think you're gonna continue to see patients take more ownership of their health, especially in long-term conditions or conditions that have a significant patient journey. And you'll continue to see them influence not only the language that's used, but also uh, the stakeholders, You know how much uh, patients are regarded as in charge of their own health. Dr. G, I'm going to turn it to you too for your take about, you know, how the cancer community has changed, how we talk about care and why. So I, I completely agree with your comment. Um, you know, patients don't fail therapy, the therapy fails the patients. And that's really a crucial distinction in, in the words we use, but it matters. Um, it's crucial for patients to understand that it's not their fault. And we as a medical community, as a scientific community need to do better. Um, and Matt, you're exactly right also about this um, rise of the, the navigator. Um, you know, I, I, a personal example, I actually did this myself for a friend who is also an oncologist, but when, you know, when you're the patient, when you're facing these news and especially when prognosis is not great, uh, it's awful hard to really be objective when you're worrying about you know, am I going to be around to see my kids graduate high school? Um, and so it's really crucial, I think, for everybody. Um, um, and I think it's a good thing. It's been a, a, a good change in our approach. Awesome. Well, thank you all. What a great conversation. Again, we didn't leave enough time. I do want to leave everyone with a little bonus. And that is, as I pinged you in the chat, I want to just get each one of your key takeaways here, something you'd like to leave the audience with. I know I'm springing this on you, but you're all very smart people, but it gives us uh, one last pearl of wisdom to, to leave with the audience. So Uj, I'm going to put you on the hot seat because I know as a PhD, you should be, you know, the guy that can answer this well. <laughs> I would say that, you know, I think we've often focused on innovation. I think more and more we need to focus on democratization. And I think Matt brought this up. It's about democratization of information for people, the way that you talk to people, the way you engage them but also giving more and more people access to these life-saving medications and figuring out ways to not burden the healthcare system with the cost of those medications. So there are tough choices we have to make as a society. Sorry, that wasn't a very quick thought, but that's my closing thought. That was pretty quick. And I told you that, you know, you'd come through. So I'm, I'm uh, proud of you. Thank you, Ush. Uh, Matt? Um, I, I think for me, ASCO just demonstrated yet yeah, again that uh, clients need digital tools to pair with in-person communication, data, and, and research to really round out the ability to communicate effectively with patients, land their message when they need to deliver it, and deliver the correct message. 
Awesome. JPEGs? Um, I would say I'm reminded at every medical meeting I attend, whether it's ASCO or others, that there is a patient behind every data point. There is a patient behind every data point. And as communicators, professionals, the more we can keep the patient at the center of what we do and really listen to them and understand them and adapt to their needs, um, the better we'll all be. And we have a, a long way to go, but um, after hearing these experts chat and I hope we can continue the conversation, I'm, I'm reassured um, and, and hopeful. Awesome. And then last but not least, Dr. G. I thought I'd bring it back to the theme, you know, the presidential theme of ASCO of equity. I, I think we all can make a difference. And, um, you know, whether as medical healthcare providers um, and industry and communication, uh, you know, it's find the hidden talent. It'll actually be good for all of us um, to let the best people shine. Well, that's a great way to end us. So with that, JPEGs, Uj, Matt, Dr. G, thank you so much for taking your time. Thank you everyone for listening in.